Hello everyone, all across India and all across the world. So as promised, I have come up with the Thinking Fast and Slow Part 2. Let's start this beautiful session. I am Shruti Kaura class and I am an award winner at an academy. Many a times I have told all of you that I have got this special batch on which it is written I am remarkable. So you all can have a look at it and as well as you all can have a glimpse of my award. This is my award. Moving further, there are a lot of batch courses that are going on and that are going to start. Please enroll yourself in order to have the maximum benefit of the live sessions of an academy. My personal batch, if you really want to talk about my personal batch, it's going to start from here. It is a batch aim for CAT 2022 and OMS. It's also going to start. You all can enroll yourself in it. Moving further. If I talk about the LMP, that is a live mentorship program. Now here you'll get the benefits of iconic subscription. And one day I would like to see all your faces here. And no doubt this will happen. Next, my coach all across an academy, all across India and all the countries where an academy is there. Don't forget to use the code S for our life to get the discounts. If an academy is giving the discounts, I am announcing it over and over again and again that use this code to get the discount and to get the maximum benefit. Now, there are two types of membership at an academy. One is plus, another is iconic. For both the membership, you have to use the code S for alive and then click on proceed to pay. Generally, 24 months and 12 months membership, they are considered as the most economical memberships and they are the most popular too. Same is the case for Iconic. The same rule applies for Iconic as well. You use the code Escoralife, click on proceed to pay and then enjoy the benefits. Is this all? Now, An Academy is always full of surprises, right? So, a big surprise awaits you. This time, An Academy Cat Mega Combat is here for you. This time, let's hope you get lucky. So, be a part of the lucky draw and the 250 participants will be rewarded with big prizes. So what are you waiting for class? On 29th of August, let's meet on 29th of August at 12 p.m. and roll for free. Oh my God. I can see some exciting prizes here. Go ahead. I mean, come on. Enjoy the benefit. Next. Oh my God. There is more to it. First, you will get the discount through my code. That is Escoralive. Second, there were prices. Third, again a limited edition offer is there. If you buy for 12 months, you will get 3 months absolutely free. Same goes for 24 months. If you take subscription for 24 months again, you are going to get 3 months absolutely free. Moving further, but for that, don't forget to use the code SKAURALIVE. S-K-A-U-R-A-L-I-V-E. Now, for all of you, there is one more announcement. An Academy is looking for campus ambassadors from colleges all across India. So you stand a chance to win big rewards. Wow, this is really good news for all of you. And you already have got an experience on the Independence Day too. So you'll get the industry best incentive. You'll, work, you'll get the work from home opportunity. You'll get the certificates from An Academy. And you will win amazing goodies and gadgets. Again, the condition is don't forget to use the code as for life. Moving further. Scholarship test is there. 55 black scholarship test is there as I just mentioned. This time there are a lot of goodies and other things as well. So use the code as for life. Books that can change your life. Leaders are always readers. This is one of my favorite quotes and I use it quite frequently. Those who don't read in their life, I mean, I don't say that they, they don't stand a chance to, you know, learn or miss a lot of things. But then at the end of the day, if you read and if you read really well, if you're a well-read person, there are very high chances of you becoming a leader as compared to the rest of the people. Next, the most important question that I often encounter, should I read during exams, class, every 
one of you, I mean most of the people don't even attend the live session when their exams are going on, but then uh, the, those things, keeping those things apart, the main question for the time being is that should I read during exams? Let me give you the answer. You know, according to a study, if you read only just for six minutes, it could minimize your stress by 68%. Can you imagine? You are reading just for 6 minutes and your stress levels are getting reduced by 68%. So, how does this particular study prove that you know you should read during your exams? Ultimately, the question remains the same. Now, are you able to relate class what I am hinting through? Please write these facts in your live chat that only if you read any book or novel for 6 minutes, your stress levels will come down to 68%. Although you are reading with me for sometimes for 45 minutes, sometimes for you know 50 minutes, sometimes for 55 or 58 too and sometimes for 65 too. But then the idea is that imagine 6 minutes leads to 68 percent imagine 65 minutes oh my god all those of you if anybody god forbids is going through a tumultuous situation in their life or they are having that stress imagine what reading can do to you class these concepts are the proven concepts that i am teaching to all of you trust me we all should take this opportunity grab it with both the hands and let's go ahead Let's learn about these books through my videos. So my videos in all could actually going to act as a stress buster for all of you because we are going to read about the fantastic Nobel Prize winning or the best seller novels. Next, if your stress will be minimized while you are giving the exam, it will increase your productivity. It will increase your test results, right? If the question says so, that should I study during the exam? Should I study? Should I read novels? Point number two, even if you read just for six minutes, your stress levels will definitely come down to 68%. Let's not 68. Let me put it some 30 or 40, right? I'm only talking about six minutes. But if your stress levels have come down, how is it going to help you in your exam? It will help you in a way. How is it directly proportional is that your, if your stress levels are reduced, your productivity, your results will definitely come up. That it's inversely proportional. Stress and productivity are inversely proportional. So that is how it's very important. Next. In the part one, I asked you the question. That these are two images spam blocker 96% spam free here only 4% spam spam blocker both are the ads for a spam blocker price is also same $290 buy both the options are same it's just like that I told you 96% spam free and here I told you 4% spam right exactly the same line in your live chat, only 4% spam. Option number one. Option number two, 96% spam free. I am not using the word free here. So are you going to pick the 4% spam or are you going to pick the 96% spam class? Okay, please post your answers in the live chat. I am giving you some time. I can see that you already you have started posting. But you want the answer? Shall I give you the answer? Everybody is waiting desperately for the answer. Let's go ahead. Actually, decision depends on how you frame the question. This is called as the framing effect. Again, let me give you one more question, one more puzzle. I'm showing you two images of a noodle. Here it's written 80% fat free. And here it's written 20% fat. Again, which one are you going to choose? 80% fat.
fact free write down in the live chat class all across india write down so that you learn what is the framing effect tomorrow you are going to be managers and the leaders or entrepreneurs this concept of framing is going to help you for sure now 80% fat free or 20% fat if you talk about this question right i have told you that it depends on how you are going to frame the question that is called as a framing effect let's take a third example i am showing you two yogurt pots you must have eating you know you must have been eating yogurts like there are a lot of flavors strawberry flavor mango flavor blackberry flavor right similarly i am showing you two yogurt pots on one it's written 10% fat and another is saying 90% fat free again class which one are you going to choose which one you think is most preferable to you let's go ahead find out now the framing effect will always lead you to pick the option where the percentage the number is higher in the first case you have chosen 96% in the second case here you have chosen 80% and in the third case you have chosen again the 90% so the idea is that it depends how marketers or the managers or whosoever is designing the campaign how he is going to frame the question ultimately if you look at all the three options they all are same yes absolutely correct they all are same 90% fat free or 10% fat is the same because 90% fat free means still 10% fat is left point number 2 if i say 80% fat free that means 20% fat is still there which i am showing you in the second option third if i tell you 96% spam free that means 4% is still left this is what i showed you in the first image so ultimately ultimately why you always pick the second option or the option with the higher number again this is a cognitive bias now i look at this image half full or half empty there are there is one glass or there are two glasses whatever some people will see it as half full some people will see it as half empty just one glass having this much water but the answer differs so this bias affects our decision making class when the same thing is being said in different ways ultimately it's going to affect our decision making how this framing is useful for all of you now the question is going on in your mind that ma'am how this framing is going to affect you know me how is it useful in my life how it will help me in my decision making actually your decisions are affected by the way questions are framed same thing i showed you in the plus session you remember the question was very simple like what is the main idea but the way question has been framed it looked too difficult to me ultimately the gist was very simple did you remember all of you we did that in one of the plus sessions next in other words class we all are influenced by how the same fact or the question is presented we all are influenced in a way how that same fact that same question is being presented to us our mind is tend to pick up the option which is influencing us more than the other let's talk about a medical procedure where there is only a 90% chance of survival the doctor say oh there is a 90% chance of survival let's say you know you went along with somebody and the doctor is saying oh that's perfectly safe you have a 90% chance of survival or if the doctor tells you that oh there is a 10% chance of mortality <laughs> like which option will make you more concerned 
which option will you reject first obviously the 10% chance of mortality but if you look at the first option that is 90% chance of survival that's also same even the 10% chance of mortality and the 90% chance of survival they both are same right so ultimately in 1981 Tversky and Kahneman they conducted an experiment class right and talking about an experiment they conducted an experiment regarding to this framing effect like you know regards to the framing effect they did some experiment what happened in that experiment let's discuss they called the students of Stanfi and British Columbia and they gave them a brief questionnaire there was a classroom setting right they did an experiment to prove this framing effect and they did this experiment who Tversky and Kahneman that is a Nobel Prize winner of this book that is Daniel Kahneman they both conducted an experiment at British Columbia and Stanfi and they gave a brief questionnaire in a classroom kind of a setting they just asked to imagine that let's say US is preparing for an Asian disease there is going to be a disease and that disease is going to kill 600 people so there are two programs that that are presented to the students to deal with the problem they said that there is going to be a disease which is going to kill some 600 people and then two programs are presented to the students to deal with the problem let's say if program A is adopted then 200 people will be saved he said that we have to adopt we have to think of some solution to save the people so they chalked out some program A and program B under program A that program A will save 200 people and program B is going to have a one third probability that 600 people will be saved <laughs> I'm repeating it once again one third probability that is one out of three one third probability that only 600 people will be saved and there is a two third probability that no people will be saved oh my god either 200 in the A then in B either 600 or 0 and then to 600 is just one third probability now what you have noticed in both the programs did you notice that both the program will result in the same number of deaths but they are framed in two different ways please have a look at it that actually both the options are same but it depends how the question is framed now you know what happened what was the result of that study what was the conclusion actually the results concluded that 72 percent of the participants they chose program a because they wanted to save some 200 people they agreed with the positive framing because in the option two you said that there is just one third probability that 600 people will be saved but there is a two third probability that no people will be saved so 72 percent students of british columbia and stanford they chose option a there 200 people were saved next now only 28 percent chose b that is a negative framing so first i discuss the framing effect with you and how that are going to define that are going to actually help you in your decision making then i told you about the positive framing and the negative framing now even though outcomes were same in the 96 percent spam free or the four percent spam free 80 percent fat free or 20 percent fat free 90 percent you know fat or 10% kind of you know fat free or 90% fat free or 10% fat even the outcomes were same the vast majority of people they always choose the more positive option our mind is actually framed in a way that we always choose the more positive option let's talk about the case of a surgery 
again if i say you you have a 90% chance of surviving the operation and if i say you you have a 10% chance of dying during the operation you will always go for the positive frame this is how you should frame your questions let's take the next case of medication in case of medication class what could be the positive framing if you take this medicine you will live if you don't take this medication if you don't take this medicine you will die that's a very negative framing if you are doing some sort of negotiation and if your framing is like this hey come on it will be a win win situation for both of us we will both benefit from this deal rather if you say you will lose out if you don't take the deal come on this is a negative framing you will lose out if you don't take the deal that is a wrong i won't say wrong putting in the right or wrong boxes it's kind of you know too broad of a, a process to define here but then i would say positive framing that we both will be benefited from this deal is much better than the negative framing that you will lose if you don't take the deal in case of sports we are the fifth best team in the league fifth best and out of five we are the worst team in the league let's say there are just five teams you can also say we are the fifth best rather if you are saying out of five we are the worst that's not going to work next even if you talk about politics we won more seats than the last election we won more seats than the last election or we only won one seat out of 327 that's a negative framing it depends how you are going to look at it we won more seats than the last election and hey we just won one seat out of 327 not so great so all these examples they clearly showed that human mind its mind it gives more value to certainty than loss or risk class it has been proven by the nobel prize winner daniel kahneman that human mind human beings they value they give importance to certainty then the loss or risk we really don't want any kind of loss or risk so what is this loss aversion aversion is to avoid so what is this loss aversion our mind always tend to focus on the profit and we always try to avoid the loss or the pain that's for sure and if you talk about behavioral economics economics then loss aversion refers to this phenomena where a real or a potential loss is perceived by individuals as psychologically or emotionally more severe for example if i talk about before i go to the example what did i just say is that my mind if i talk about loss aversion in behavioral economics so what is this phenomena of loss aversion actually my mind gives more value to the loss be it psychology be it emotionally rather than an equivalent gain if i have lost 100 rupees i am more concerned on that rather than i have gained 50 rupees no even though i have gained 200 rupees or something like that my mind is going to give more value to the loss this is what i was explaining you please look here write down in your live chats loss aversion after the framing effect what is positive framing you understood class everybody all across the world all across india second negative framing you understood in several cases in surgery medication politics sports we saw now at the end of it through framing we realize that human mind gives more value to certainty rather than the loss or risk based on this situation based on this phenomena this is called as loss aversion where a real or a potential loss is perceived psychological or emotionally more severe than an equivalent gain 
any kind of real or potential loss is viewed either psychology or emotionally more severe than an equivalent gain. This is the theory of loss aversion. For example, let's say the pain of losing $100 is often far greater than the joy gained in finding the same amount. I told you the same thing. You lost $100. You are more concerned, you are psychologically, emotionally disturbed that you lost $100 rather than you have gained $100. No. So, in the business world class, it can be easy to place a higher value on avoiding loss. You always place higher value on avoiding loss than on the potential gain. This is what you call loss aversion. That is a pleasure from grain. Now look here, look at this bar graph, pleasure from gain, the bar is much less, rather the pain from loss, this bar is little higher. So we always place higher value on avoiding loss, then on potential gain, this is what you call loss aversion. So if you articulate, if you talk about the idea of loss aversion, Researchers explained how scenarios in people's everyday lives are governed by fear. If we simply talk about the idea of loss aversion, no. Researchers will tell you that every day, the life of individuals, of human beings, they are governed by fear. If you understood loss aversion, it will help you in making good business decisions because you will no longer... Be subdued by your fear. Now, the third term is sunk cost fallacy. If we understood this phenomenon of loss aversion, okay, we will also understand the phenomenon of sunk cost fallacy. Now, what is a sunk cost? I'll tell you before I move to this sunk cost. Again, I'm repeating, we discussed the framing effect. That is 96% spam free or 4% spam. Then we did positive and negative framing. Then we talked about loss aversion. And what is loss aversion? Basically, the loss, the real or potential loss is viewed as psychologically or emotionally more severe than an equivalent gain. And if we understood this phenomena, then maybe we can avoid the sunk cost fallacy. Now, what is this sunk cost? The question is, is it like that? Here it seems like my money is actually underwater. Is it like sunk? Sunk is like when something is being drowned, it's underwater. What is that sunk cost? Let's go and check. The third term is that sunk cost is a cost that has already been paid for. You have already paid for it and it cannot be recovered in any way. Sunk cost is that cost which has already been paid for. And it is, it, you cannot recover it in any way. Cost that has already occurred, you cannot recover that in the future. That is a sunk cost. What is a cost that has already occurred and you cannot recover it in the future? That is a sunk cost. For example, your rent. You stay somewhere, you pay your rent. That is a sunk cost. You cannot recover that. Marketing campaign. If you do some expenses in the marketing campaign, that is a sunk cost. There are very few chances that you are not going to recover it back. Or maybe the money is spent on new equipment. They all are examples of sunk cost. Next, let's consider the case of a restaurant here. He's, somebody is thinking of expanding his restaurant. He is thinking of having a restaurant chain. And they spend some $10,000 on market research. Look here. I know all of you are thinking about this $10,000. But rather than looking at the left hand side image. Look what I am talking about. Let's say any one of you wants to be a restaurant here tomorrow. And you plan to have your own restaurant chains. Maybe in Australia, Canada, US, UK, anywhere. And you spend some $10,000 on the market research. And what will you do by that research? Maybe you will determine the opening location of the branch. Maybe some area is profitable or not. And such similar factors you, you are trying to find out through market research.
but then you ultimately drop the idea of expanding your restaurant so you know that ten thousand dollars is a sunk cost gone it has already been occurred it cannot be recovered in the future so if you talk about economics a sunk cost is any past cost that has already been paid sunk cost is any past cost that has already been paid and it cannot be recovered let's take one more example let's say a business may have invested a million dollars into new hardware look here again one example was of a restaurant right here second a business has already invested a lot of money into the hardware this money is gone it is a past cost that has already been paid for it cannot be recovered so it shouldn't figure into the business decision making process you cannot figure it in the business decision making process next you repaired your phone a month ago now another problem has come up many of times you do that class <laughs> immediately you you know you uh, not always is the case that you go and you buy a new phone generally you think of repairing that phone first so you repaired but that again after a month or two another problem has come up which will again cost you big money and as you repaired it a month ago you will again go on and repair it why because you don't want your repairing cost from a month to go to waste your phone got you know it started malfunctioning one month ago you went to repair your phone right now again a fault has come up what will you do will you buy another phone no sometimes the case is that you will again go and repair that phone of yours because you don't want your repairing cost from a month actually to go to waste why breakups are so hard oh my god <laughs> actually i'm taking you to a new concept after that sunk cost i am teaching you something more important as well everybody please concentrate all across india why breakups are always hard why there is so much you know a uh, kind of tearful goodbyes and you know sometimes it could be very you know abusive arguments as well sometimes it's so painful hard depressing dark gloomy why let's say somebody came and gave you this example that we have been dating on for 6 months now so i might as well carry on dating him or her this is again see i have been involved with somebody for the last 6 months even though i am realizing inside that we both are not gelling well with each other but since what is the reason i gave to my mind sunk cost fallacy i said that we have been going along for the last 6 months so okay let's go ahead let's take it further if we break up now it will be a waste because human mind always thinks of profit and loss so another example of the sunk cost fallacy are you realizing what i'm trying to tell you class not just through an example of restaurateur you know a business who has started the hardware business or even the repairing of your phone and fourth breakups it may be the reason why people often decide to carry on this is the reason why most of the people carry on with their unhappy marriages sunk cost fallacy that so much time has already been passed upon we have already paid for that it cannot be recovered so that's okay let's continue so what is this sunk cost you understood the sunk cost and what is this sunk cost policy basically i'll tell you before that don't clinch to a mistake just because you spent a lot of time or money making it don't just cling to a mistake ek galti se chipke mat raho just because you have spent time and money making it please 
it's a very important lesson for all of you and again these are the lessons given by a nobel prize winner in the first part i showed you obama giving him the nobel prize medal next basically the sunk cost fallacy occurs when we are unable to cut our losses we are unable to cut our losses due to the past money or the time we have spent on an activity we are unable to cut our losses we are continuously facing losses losses it's whether you talk about a relationship whether you talk about a hardware business whether you talk about you know repairing of your phone you continue with that thing because you have already spent money and time on it and you continue to spend more time or money on it so this kind of fallacy often leads to irrational decisions i believe if we talk about decision making how these sessions are going to help you in decision making these are the factors you should consider you should take into account which will actually make you vulnerable make you prone in taking irrational decision that is illogical decisions next losses always terrify us there is no second thought to it losses always terrify us the possibility of losing what is close to our heart or wallet impacts our decision making process losses always terrify us class what is close to our heart or our wallet it actually impacts our decision making process no you should not consider the thing that is the only thing we generally consider we cling on to some past mistakes or some past activities and we keep on continuing that thing because we have actually programmed our mind by thinking that i have already spent too much money and time on it because these are the things that are close to my heart they are close to my wallet no that's not right a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush old wisdom has taught us that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush bird in the hand is worth two in the bush yahan jo mere haath mein bird hai wo un jhadiyon mein ke piche jo birds hai unse better hai that means whatever i have with me right now is better than what i am planning to think or what i am planning to do in the future no that's not always the case although that is not always how we process our decisions especially when cognitive biases come into the picture now i told you earlier i just taught you the term but now let's dig deep into the term what is this cognitive bias basically cognitive ease or cognitive bias like whatever is easier for system 2 it is likely to be believed my system 1 is fast and it has already been proven in the part 1 that system 1 is somewhere a little faulty it's illogical it's irrational it sometimes take decision based on emotions or many other plot factors system 2 is kind of slow wise but then even system 2 it actually believes whatever is easy for system 2 as well and what do i mean by easy how am i going to define the ease what do i mean by this cognitive ease that what is easy for my mind actually it comes from idea repetition clear display maybe i told you about priming a primed idea and even one song good mood it depends on my good mood it depends on priming it depends on again and again again and again idea is being repeated clearly something is being displayed in front of me i tend to believe those things they are easy for me to believe if somebody is repeating the ideas again and again somebody is showing me the priming there is a clear cut display of some things and it depends on my good mood too so system 2 takes those things into action into account which are easy even the repetition of a wrong thing can lead people to accept it if i show you even the wrong thing no it lead people accept that despite knowing that it's untrue but i'm repeating that wrong thing again and again it will actually lead people to accept it even though they know it's untrue 
since the concept becomes familiar and it's cognitively easy to process. Concept, I'm so familiar with the concept, it's being repeated every time. So it's cognitively easy for me to process. I'll give you one more example of loss aversion is endowment effect. Now, what is this endowment effect? Even in a lot of insurance policies, it's written endowment effect. So before I go further, let me just go back. I, we studied about sunk cost fallacy, right? Where we discussed a lot of examples. What is sunk cost? The rent, for example, the rent, the marketing uh, campaign expenses, maybe the phone repair, the breakups, or whatever cost I have already been paid for, which cannot be recovered in the future, even not for the cost, the time. That was sunk cost. Before that, we did loss aversion that human mind is programmed in a way to avoid the losses, the uncertainty or the risk. Before that, of course, we did framing that is a positive framing and the negative framing. And now we are doing the endowment effect. What is this endowment effect? Right? Look here. Value of my thing. Okay? 10, 10, 10. Value of your thing. <laughs> Five, five, five. Look here. So endowment effect is that class. You are willing to pay more to keep something you already own. You own something and you are willing to pay more price to continue owning that particular thing. While new customers will be less inclined to pay the same asking price. Why will the new customers pay the same price? That same asking price, new customers will be less inclined to pay. For example, if you try to sell your car, then according to you, it could be 4L, 5L, 3L, 2L, 2.5, according to you. But in the market, People want to buy that same car at a much lower price. Your thing, so you make it 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. But for others, value of other thing is 5, 5, 5. So according to them, that same price, the price that you have quoted for L, it could be 2 or 3 for the people in the market. That is what is endowment effect. You give more value to the products you own. And you are ready to shell that price in order to actually continue owning them. So basically what happens, why this happens, you attach emotions to something. When you attach emotions to something, your mind automatically overvalues it. Class, when you attach emotions to something in your mind, your mind automatically overvalues that. If I talk about status quo, we discussed about endowment effect, right? Before that, loss aversion, sunk cost, framing, loss aversion. Now I'm talking about status quo bias. What is this? Actually, it is named after the investor's tendency to prolong. You're prolonging and you're maintaining the status quo. Come on, it's time to change. So if an investor, let's say if an investor is given a lot of options, many complex and confusing choices, what will happen? They tend to choose whichever option extends their current arrangement. He chooses that. Take another example. You are currently, you must be having certain cable or satellite provider. Am I correct all across India? You all must be having some cable or satellite provider. Now, it's an example of how that status quo bias, it's going to influence your everyday decisions. Your everyday decisions are again influenced by this status quo bias. Oh my God. We all have been doing all these things, but we have never thought so deeply about it. It's a very simple example. My cable or satellite service provider. So even though another provider will come up and that another provider will offer me more channels and at a cheaper price. But let's say I believe in Tata. I believe in Dish. 
I believe in X, Y, Z. So, what will I do? Actually, I am already familiar with the rates of Tata or Dish or some X, Y, Z. The choices and the customer service that my current service provider is offering. And according to the status quo bias, the present situation bias, it will lead me to stay with my current service provider. I might, I might get that fear inside me. Oh, don't, oh, I don't know if the new service provider is offering me a cheaper price, more channels, but maybe the customer service won't be that good. Maybe I will come up with maybe, maybe and maybe. Am I correct? So, based on the status quo bias, I'll stay with my current service provider. I want to keep the things in the way they are. I don't want to take a risk on an unfamiliar or uncharted territory. I would like to have that potentially better service option. Maybe, maybe. But I would like to stick with my current service cable on satellite service provider next so after the you know loss aversion we discuss the endowment effect after the endowment effect i discuss that how the satellite service provider or status quo buyers and i'm talking about overconfidence confident does not mean accuracy please write this line in your live chat or try to understand that confidence does not always mean accuracy. It's not the case that one who always remains confident, he is always right. He is always true. No, that's not the case. For example, let's say you attended a baseball game, right? And after the game, you insisted that you knew the winning team. Like who is who was going to win beforehand? Let's say you say that, you know, I watch even though we went together for the baseball game, but I knew who was going to win. This is a hindsight bias. It's the tendency upon learning the outcome of an event. You learn the outcome of an event such as an experiment, a sporting event, a military decision, or maybe a political decision and you overestimated one's ability that you have foreseen that outcome. You are overestimating, I'm not saying underestimating, you are overestimating your capability to foresee the outcome. I knew. Oh, come on, are you an oracle of matrix? Are you like one who does prophecy? No. Then how are you saying this fact? How are you overestimating yourself that you have foreseen the outcome? So, confidence does not always means accuracy. Here, some algorithms like expert intuition comes into play. Algorithms, howsoever primitive they are, they are applied with discipline. They often outdo experts. Let's talk about an example of intuition in real life. Can you see this intuitive thinking? Look here at the left part. It's fast. It's automatic, it's emotional. If you talk about the rational thinking, it's slow, effortful, logical. So if I talk about an example of intuition in real life, sometimes you say, oh, I looked extensively for the information before making a decision. Oh, come on, I looked extensively before making a decision. I have checked all the parameters before coming to this decision. I have made up my mind. I did not have the time to decide analytically, so I relied on my experience. This is experience-based decision. So buying decisions, again, they are rational. If you are focusing on the price, quality, feature, reliability, and warranty, that's a rational decision-making. But if you are going for the look and the feel, the esteem associated with it, the brand, safety, fear, then that's an emotional decision. This is what we are saying. I did not have time to decide analytically, so I relied on my experience. Or 
again emotional decision making what will you say i was not completely sure how to decide so i decided based on my gut feeling look here i am telling you three types the first type is that you said i look extensively for information everywhere before making this decision that is rational second said i did not have the time so i just relied on my past experiences that is experience based decision making third that is the emotional decision making you said i was not completely sure how to decide so i decided based on my gut feeling so if your system 2 is lazy you might end up making stories in your mind right and one of the limits to our ability to evaluate information objectively we have a you know if we have a limited ability to actually evaluate an information objectively we don't evaluate an information objectively this is what we call narrative policies that means we are drawn we are attracted towards a less desirable outcome why why the less desirable outcome no we don't desire but then it has got a better story let me go for it narrative policy the way someone has told the story to me i was being carried away towards that this is an important concept in behavioral finance class the last option that you all should know small sample size most of us know that small sample sizes are not as representative as large samples for example if i am conducting a study an experiment or a research and if i did the research on a very small sample sometimes it is not as representative as large sample what do i mean even if that is the case my system one believes that small sample outcomes without validation if you are talking about system one it believes small sample outcomes with validation we make decisions based on insufficient or unrepresentative data how do we make decisions on insufficient or unrepresentative data insufficient or unrepresentative data based on that we make decision even if there is a doubt even if let's say some doubt comes in my mind my system one suppresses that doubt how because i start constructing stories that is what i discuss the narrative policy the status quo bias overconfidence and i attribute causality now what is causality i'll discuss all that causality as well but once my mind has accepted that wrong conclusion as true my associative mechanism will trigger for example i told you soap so if i showed you a lot of restroom related things and soup soup if i showed you a lot of food items so when i accept the wrong conclusion as true based on the stories my associative mechanism will be triggered it will start spreading related ideas soap soup 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 soap soap and soup soup through my belief system and what i will do i'll start searching for patterns i'll start searching for explanation and it will lead me to the events that are wrong that are unsupportable so in short class when researchers are constrained to a small sample size when a lot of researchers they are constrained to a small sample size by sample size i mean the number of people or the number of items or animals or things on which you conduct the experiment or the study when they are very less in number right when researchers are constrained to a small sample size for economic or logistical reasons there could be economical there could be logistical reason they may have to settle for less conclusive results look here the population is this one and your sample is only this much so what will happen you have to settle for less conclusive results now whether or not this is an important issue that depends ultimately on the size of the effect you are studying 
For example, you have taken a small size. In some cases, this could be useful. But what are those cases? What are those situations? For example, it will give you more meaningful results in a poll of people living near an airport. They are affected negatively by the air traffic. Some people living near the airport, they are affected negatively by the air traffic. They are, if you only consider those people staying near airport, that's okay, that would be better. Rather than if you take all the people at, you know, different, based on their different education levels, no, that will not be actually good. So representativeness is where we use our stereotypes, our biases, our policies, our heuristics. And based on that, we judge our probabilities. So it is going to affect the judgment we make when we meet new people. Let's say even when we meet new people, this will affect. We form inaccurate impression of others. We generally misjudge a new acquaintance or maybe when we are on a blind date, we generally misjudge. And even in the financial markets, one example of this representative bias is when investors automatically assume you are an investor let's say one among you is and you automatically assume oh my god that's a good company so you assumed that is how that company is being represented it created a representative bias in your mind that good companies make good investments however that is not necessarily the case that is not necessarily the case that good companies make good investments. Now, why that is the case? Because a good company may be excellent in their own business. They could be excellent at their own business, but a poor judge of other businesses. The same company could be a very excellent, you know, at their own business but could be a poor judge of other businesses. So representative sample, this is what I was talking about, sample size. They are important because they ensure that all relevant types of people are included in the sample. The right mix of people should be interviewed. If my sample is not representative, it will always be subjected to bias and my ultimate decision will be flawed. So, a particular survey also showed that large sample size don't guarantee accurate survey result. So, the next question that must have popped up in your mind is that, so ma'am, if we take large samples, can it guarantee results? No. Even a survey has shown that even if you take large sample sizes, they don't guarantee accurate survey results. It's not about small or large, it's about relevant people. Surveying, studying, interviewing or whatever, experimenting the relevant things, people or other, you know, cases. Before I go to the causal explanation, before I explain, I'll take that in the next session about the causal explanation because this is a very deep book. It has got a lot of concepts of economics, behavioral psychology and definitely a lot of concepts of utility theory too. So we'll discuss these, we'll take this further but for the timing I want all of you to work on these terms of framing, status quo bias, endowment effect, representative, then positive framing, negative framing, loss aversion. Please do work on it. I'll share the assignment questions in the comment. Complete that and trust me, once you go through this complete book, your knowledge of business, MBA, and a lot of concepts of economics and psychology will be clear. That is behavioral psychology and how you should take decisions in your life. So, this is Shruti Kaurav signing off for today's class. 
definitely we'll meet in the next session and please do learn it complete your assignments on time so that the difficult rc passages will actually become easier for you all right i'll take your leave adios and gracias take care don't forget to like subscribe and definitely complete the assignment take care all right